in 1996 when I received my first appointment beyond being appointed to attend seminary, which was my very first appointment. But my first appointment with congregations, I was in a very strange year. I was a quarter-time chaplain at Gallaudet University. No, I was a half-time chaplain at Gallaudet, quarter-time chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was then a federal psychiatric hospital. And then I was, the last quarter time, was split between three deaf congregations in the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference. The next year I would leave that position to go to be the pastor of the Magathy United Methodist Church of the Deaf in Pasadena. There has not been a year in all the years I have been out of seminary and in the ministry that on Christmas Eve I do not think of the Magathy United Methodist Church of the Deaf, and particularly their lay leader who is named Ed Johnson, also known as My Deaf Father. He had a son who was my age, and he taught me more about the community at Magathy and the deaf community than anyone I'd ever known before, he and his wife Flo. But what I think of every Christmas Eve is Ed signing O Holy Night, which is just one of the most beautiful things. He was a poetic signer, and he signed this song so beautifully, and it touched me so much that every Christmas, and he has been dead for quite some time now, I think of him signing. I also think of the stories he told me about what it was like to be raised as a child who was deaf. Ed had been born hearing, like most deaf people. He did not, he was not born deaf. He lost his hearing when he was probably about two or three years old because he had contracted spinal meningitis and his fever went so high that it took his hearing. And he grew up in a hearing family among hearing brothers and sisters with hearing parents. And in their efforts to have him healed, he was sometimes dragged to church services where he understood nothing that was happening. And one time into a big tent with sawdust on the ground, and he was dragged to the front where the pastor, the pastor, made him kneel in front of him and with both fists pounded his ears repeatedly until they bled, saying, demon come out of him so he can hear. Ed was still deaf after that. And the pastor's response was, he has the devil in him, and he won't be healed because he has no faith. This was a child of about eight years old. That story stuck with me because that is something we need to look at for the story today. Because the only way to understand sometimes the stories, what they mean in the Bible, is to understand exactly what they don't mean. And nowhere in this story should anyone infer that because Jesus says to a man who cannot walk, your sins are forgiven, and he gets up and walks, that he was unable to walk because of his sin. He was not being punished. We think maybe that's antiquated thinking, but that still happens today, doesn't it? Hurricane Katrina, there were televangelists who blamed the people for their own suffering because they said New Orleans is a city full of sin. And the earthquake in Haiti that claimed over 100,000 lives, probably closer to 200,000, and they never will know exactly the number. They were blamed because of the sins, not of the people there today, but the sins of their ancestors. Among the 100,000 plus people who died were the chairman of UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and also volunteers of mission. And it strikes me today that yesterday our mission team was supposed to take off on their trip, which had to be canceled because of the pandemic. And I always pray for teams when they go off into the world to help serve others in the name of Jesus Christ, because you never know what might happen along the way. Before those things was the AIDS pandemic. And people blamed those who were sick because of their behavior. They said their behavior was the cause for their punishment. Back in the early 80s, I cannot tell you how many funerals I did for people who contracted AIDS or HIV and later the became, became AIDS through blood transfusions before blood was being tested. Their families would not let me say what had killed them because the stigma was so great. And even with the pandemic we're facing today, the COVID pandemic, there are people who blame China or the Chinese people. And Asian Americans, whether they're of Chinese descent or Thai descent or J Japanese descent, have been beaten in the streets by those who blame them for the pandemic. So I want you to be absolutely certain that Jesus is not equating sin with physical limitations or disabilities. So why then would he say friend? Or a better interpretation of the Greek here is child, as in child of God, your sins are forgiven. 
Why would he say your sins are forgiven if he's not equating this man's inability to walk with sinfulness? I think it's because of the audience that was there. There were people who had heard stories of Jesus and his healing and his ability to perform miracles. He was, in fact, as the song said, a miracle man. And even though there were those people in the crowd, the crowd also drew the naysayers, the Pharisees and the scribes. They came from as far away as Jerusalem. They came from all over Judea because they wanted to listen to him, not to learn from him, but so that they might be able to trap him and catch him and condemn him. This is also a story that reveals Jesus' power to heal, certainly his power to heal physical disabilities because the man had not been able to walk and suddenly he is up walking and he's running home carrying his mat. Just like later on, Peter and John would be able to have that same power as Jesus had promised them. You will do the things I do and greater things than these. They were able to forgive the man, to heal the man. But Jesus had also said that they would be able to forgive. He tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. He says that to them after he's been raised from the dead. So Jesus has the power to heal not just our physical bodies. He has the power to heal our spiritual selves. In the Roman Catholic Church, sometimes Protestants get a little bit snippy about the idea of confession and say, I would not go and confess my sins in that way, although we confess corporately before we take communion every time we have a prayer of confession. And the words that I speak, you speak back to me in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, or in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven because we are given the authority. But in the Roman Catholic Church, the sacrament of confession is considered a sacrament of healing for this very reason. Now let's put the story in its context if you want to understand it a little bit more. Jesus had been healing in Luke's Gospel before he even calls the first disciples. This story today comes directly after the call of the fishermen, which is a little different than the one we read last week if you read it in Luke's Gospel. They have the miraculous catch of fish, and Peter understands just by this miracle that he's witnessed that Jesus is someone from God, and he falls at his feet, and he says, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And with that confession, Jesus says, You know how to catch fish. I'm going to teach you how to catch people now. And the next person Jesus will call after this encounter with the man who was lowered through the roof will be Matthew the tax collector. Now you have to remember that this is the same tax collector that everybody in town despised, probably including those fishermen, because as they were coming in from their hard work, even on the days that they didn't catch much, they had to stop and they had to pay this corrupt man taxes. So perhaps Jesus is preparing them to learn how to forgive. And we do have the authority to forgive sins in Jesus' name. And we're given in this story the example of bringing people to Christ by removing physical barriers. We don't hear what happened later after the story when the poor man who owned the house looked up and said, what do I do now? But you've got to admire the tenacity of those people who let nothing get in their way. They knew that Jesus was there. They knew he could heal their friend, and so it didn't matter. And I just can't imagine the poor man on the mat being carried onto the roof in the midst of a crowd. So we are called to remove physical barriers. As I said in the children's sermon, Epworth is blessed to have a ramp and an elevator. And I can't tell you until I get my new knee how much those things mean to me and for how long people were unable to come to the church because they had physical limitations that prevented them from climbing steps. Now, I want to stop here and say a word, though, about the COVID precautions. I wish you could see everyone here. Everyone here has a mask on, and I am far enough away that I don't need to wear one right now. But you look beautiful in your mask. And if you've seen some of the craziness that's happening online and around the country, there is a woman in North Carolina who is buying every mask she can find to burn because she says that this is a violation of her constitutional right. And there was a public hearing in Florida about whether masks should be required or not, and a woman said masks came from the devil. The devil wants you to wear a mask. And there was even a woman there who said, and I played it three times because I wasn't sure I heard it right, she said, we are interfering with God's beautiful breathing devices. I don't wear a mask and I don't wear underwear because I don't want to interfere with God. That, folks, is crazy. 
We are not limiting people from coming to God. We're making it possible for people to come safely to church and safely to gather. Why we're still out here when other churches are indoors is because we cannot guarantee your safety in a large gathering. It's why some of our folks are going to probably remain worshiping from home for a while because they're worried about this pandemic and the virus that has taken so many people from us. And so these are not barriers, these masks and the safe distancing and the no handshaking and the no hugging. It was so hard yesterday to visit with Phyllis and not be able to hug her. But we're doing these things to remain safe so that we can get together again and worship God. But the physical barriers aren't the only ones that we put in place, are they? Judgment can be a terrible barrier for someone coming to Christ. I served a congregation some years ago, and a young woman came for the first time with her little son, who was a toddler. He had just learned to walk. I was surprised. She came by herself, and she sat there. She knew every song in the hymnal and every song in the faith we sing. And I visited her in her home, and she told me that she had gone to college. Her grandmother was the president of the United Methodist Women in one of the largest annual conferences, not the Baltimore, Washington, but one of the largest conferences within Methodism. Her grandmother was a person who was respected and deeply loved. And her granddaughter went to college, and as sometimes happens, she met a boy, fell in love, and ended up expecting the baby that I knew as her son. In an effort to do the right thing, she married the baby's father, but he didn't come to church with her. And she did not have much money. They lived in subsidized housing. And her son had nearly died at birth. He was so premature. And he came to church, and he had just learned to walk, and he fussed, and he squawked, and he made baby sounds, and he ran around. And one Sunday, he got loose from her, came up and climbed onto my lap, and sat there for part of the service. And people were very unhappy. And so, unbeknownst to me, two women decided they were going to take care of the situation. And so they went and they stood by this woman's seat in the congregation with their backs to her. And they said, if people don't know how to control their children, maybe they don't belong here. And then, if people don't know how to dress appropriately, they possibly should go somewhere else. It was the last time the young woman came back to the church. I went to see her again, and I begged her to come back. I said, please don't take that as the view of everyone in the congregation. And she said to me words that have stayed with me, just like Ed's signing of the hymn. I feel bad enough about my life right now. I don't need to go to church to feel worse. So some of the barriers that we put up are not necessarily physical. Sometimes there are judgment. Sometimes there are sense of self-righteousness. Sometimes we want people to act like us and look like us and behave like us, but that's not always what happens. There's an expression, through the roof, and that's what I titled the sermon this morning, through the roof, literally. They cut a hole in the roof to let this man down so Jesus could heal him. But we use the term through the roof for having a fit of anger or hitting the roof, that kind of expression, which is how the Pharisees responded. But through the roof can also talk about something that is accelerated and something that takes off very quickly and something that grows to the point that it's going to knock the roof off the building. That's what happened to the faith of those who witnessed the miracle and understood who Jesus was. That's the faith of people who understand that in him their sins are forgiven and they are set free. And that, friends, comes with confession. Sometimes people have told me, I am just too old, I'm too set in my ways. That is not scriptural. Jesus Christ can come into the hardest heart and bring the softness of grace that frees us and transforms us into the people that we are called to be, loving and accepting and kind, not judging others, but inviting others to the new life that we have found, which begins always, always, always by remembering where we were when Christ came to us. My friend Ed would go with me and the choir from the MAG at the United Methodist Church at the Deaf, he would go with me to other congregations, and our choir would do a presentation. They would sign a song, and then these lovely people would open themselves up to questions. They would actually say, ask us anything you want about being deaf. We are not ashamed. People would say things to them like, how do you hear your babies cry? And how do you drive when you can't hear? And how do you do this? How do you do that? Some very practical things. But almost every single time, 
someone near the end of the program would say, I am praying for you to be made whole. And I would see Ed Johnson, one of the most Christ-centered human beings I have ever known, who blessed my life incredibly, who taught me how to be a pastor. He would sigh and he would say to them, I have been made whole in Jesus Christ. I just can't hear you. Not everyone is healed physically, but we can all be healed spiritually. We can be forgiven. And we're given the authority, the authority in the name of Jesus Christ, who didn't have to hear what the Pharisees were thinking out loud because he could see into their hearts. He sees into our hearts. That's the one that always scares me, Stokes. But he sees where we fall short, but he is willing to bring us wholeness so that we might say, I still might have problems, I still might be a hot mess, but in Christ I have been made whole. Maybe people will not be healed in this life, and we lose people every day, whether it's to COVID or to age or to illness, but we don't lose them for eternity because the salvation of God in Jesus Christ comes to us and heals us and makes us whole. So my prayer is that you never let anything get in the way of you getting to Christ or bringing someone else to Christ so that that person might experience the grace and the love and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that will make us all new and lead us to eternal life. Amen.